Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for waking up uh, for this early, early talk. Um, today, I want to talk uh, about two topics, uh, NoSQL, uh, domain-driven design, and then I will try to bring those two topics together uh, and uh, tell you how I think those two topics relate to each other. So there is a, is a story about building the Tower of Babel. Um, there were people that all spoke the same language, and they built this really, really impressive tower. And people get braggy when they build something as impressive as its tower. So um, they were so braggy that someone took away their common language. And after that, they never finished the tower because they didn't have a common language. In my experience, in a lot of our software projects, we don't start with the same language. We may speak the same human language, for example, English, German, Polish, but we still speak a different language because we all have our di uh, different jargons. For example, you may have a database person and this person talks about tables. And then you have a person that is from the field of the problem you're solving and this person will talk about astronauts, spaceships and stuff like that. And then you have a programmer and she will talk about classes and um, some inheritance stuff and those three fields don't they they don't really belong together and there has to be a, some translation going on between those languages so domain driven design is this idea from eric evans um, that we can solve that differently uh, the goal of domain driven design is to find one ubiquitous language one language that everyone on the team understands um, with this language uh, we uh, we can then talk to each other about the problem that we are trying to solve and this language is not based on some technical terms, as a lot of languages in our teams are. This language is based on the uh, problem domain of the thing that we want to build. Uh, so this is the basic idea. To implement it, uh, we need two uh, preconditions. First off, we need iterative development. Uh, I think most of you here are already implementing that, doing something like Scrum or other agile met methodologies. But um, if you have any questions about that, just come to the talk later. I will skip that for now and just assume that most of you are doing that. And the second one is that you have a close relationship to, uh, uh, between your developers and the domain experts. Because you can only develop a common language if you talk to each other a lot. Because otherwise, yeah, how should that work? So hi, I'm Lucas. I come from a place where we don't have beautiful beaches. I come from a cold place called Cologne or Köln. Uh, I work for a company called ArangoDB uh, GmbH, so ArangoDB Inc. maybe, uh, translated, uh, and we build ArangoDB. Uh, ArangoDB is an open source NoSQL database. And most of you will know what open source means, I guess everyone here will know what open source means, but what exactly does NoSQL mean? Um, and that question is, in my experience, much harder than it seems from the beginning, because a lot of people think, oh, I know what NoSQL is, but uh, I'm working on a NoSQL database and I'm still not quite sure what it means. So, um, yeah, let's try to find it out. So, once there was this bubble called SQL, and it was quite clear what belongs to that bubble. Because every database that understands SQL is an SQL database. And it's quite clear that um, you just have a database and say, okay, this is my database, it belongs in this bubble, it is an SQL database. But then some people came up with this idea of no SQL. And um, quite clearly, SQL, uh, no SQL is everything that's not in this, bu this bubble, right? So is Git a no SQL database? Some people say, yes, it is. Is the file system a no SQL database? I don't think so, maybe. Um, so it is quite hard to understand from that point. And people thought, okay, this is already pr uh, pretty hard, let's make it harder. So they came up with the term not only SQL, because the NO doesn't stand for no, it stands for not only. So now we have this. So we have no idea what um, is no, no SQL. Like some SQL databases are now no SQL, and other um, databases are no SQL, but not only SQL, it's quite confusing. So I tried to find it out, um, like in a, in a conversation, you could ask, what is NoSQL? And the answer is, it is not SQL, or it's not only SQL. And then the clear question that comes up is, what exactly is SQL? 
And a lot of people will answer that it is a relational algebra. I at least <laughs> will answer that. Um, and this raises two questions, like what, is, what, what are relations and what is an algebra? I will skip the algebra part. <laughs> um, so let's talk about relations. What are relations? Um, this is a relation. So we have tuples. Um, that are uh, like bubbles of data. So in this case, we have three top. Uh, we have two, three tuples. Uh, we have uh, f the first tuple has Alice, and then some numbers with dashes in between, and then a uh, number. Um, this is our first tuple, and then we have a second tuple. Um, this doesn't help us a lot in understanding what those tuples mean because the second one, it may be a date of some kind, but the third one is just some arbitrary number. It could be anything. Um, and therefore, smart people came up with the idea that we can display that in a different way. Uh, we can display that as a table. So this is uh, the way that most uh, in, well, like interfaces of uh, web interfaces or admin tools of SQL databases show it to you. This is the way that you should think about an SQL database. It's a table. So there we now have some titles for each of those things. So we now know, okay, this is the birthday. Um, I think it's quite clear how to say like, okay, this, uh, this is how this birthday format works, but why is the city a number? Like cities are not numbers. Um, this is already quite weird, but I guess most of you that are doing rail, uh, like uh, some kind of uh, Rails or Django or other frameworks like that are quite familiar with this concept. They will think about, oh, there's probably a join going on and there is some city table and we join it together and therefore we know about the city. Uh, but uh, just think about like how we represent this. Like maybe it's not clear at this point what this number is. If you talk to some domain expert, for example, so I see a clear disconnect here. Uh, if we are solving a problem of uh, um, astronauts owning spaceships here, a domain expert may, might draw a picture and say like, okay, this is Alice, and this is uh, the spaceship, and we have an ownership thing between those two things, and they might draw an arrow. And then um, a clever uh, ad, a programmer or a database administrator would say, okay, that's quite clear, we need those three tables. And you might, and you, you must think about that the person that described the problem to you will be quite puzzled right now, because how did you get from this to this? It has no real connection, unless you know like, okay, we do joins, we do SQL, all this knowledge uh, ne needs to be there to translate from the left side to the right side. Okay, but let's first talk about the left side. So the left side is the domain world, um, and Eric Evans suggests uh, different kinds of objects in this domain world. Um, the first three I want to introduce you to are the entity, uh, the value object, and the services. Uh, so an entity is something that is identified by its identity. Um, so a person is an entity, for example. Um, because um, you can say, okay, this is this person, and if something about this person changes, because they get married and they change their last name, for example, it's still the same person. Therefore, the state of this thing needs to be mutable, because otherwise, if you change the other's name, that wouldn't work. Um, in a value object, that's different. In a, val a value object is identified uh, by it only its value. It doesn't have its own identity. So an address, in most cases, is a value object. If you change something about that value object, then it becomes a different value object. Because if you change like the number of the street, then obviously, uh, it's not the same address anymore. Um, and therefore, you can model it as being immutable. Uh, and that's important. I will come back to that in a minute. Um, and then there ha we have services. They only are described by what they do. It's a mail sending service, for example. And they are stateless. Um, they don't have any state. If you tell the service to do the same thing twice, it will do exactly the, th the same thing twice. Then we have some other patterns, uh, factories, I think most people know them. Um, then we have repositories, those are the things that can save other, well, uh, other domain objects in them. Um, so you can save, search in them and stuff like that. They are mostly backed by a database of some kind, but from the domain world you don't see a database, you only see a repository. And then we have aggregates, and aggregates are a connection of one entity with uh, one or more value objects. So for example, a person with the address they live in. Um, and this brings us 
to uh, denormalization. So what Eric Evans suggests at this point is, if you have an uh, aggregate, then you should denormalize it, because of the immutability, we can copy the object as many times as we want, and it doesn't bring any problems. Because uh, if we change the address of one person, even though there are other addresses like that, uh, you should not change them as well, because if some person moves into a new location, you probably don't want all people in that location to move as well, right? So we can denormalize at that point. But SQL is kind of resistant to that, uh, and a lot of people don't want to do that. So what if we think about lifting some of the restrictions of the way we do it in SQL databases? What if we allow that tuples contain other tuples, and that we have tuples with arbitrary uh, attributes? So. If we can do that, like we have a space shuttle and the parts, and the parts are all value objects, and you can express that in your database, then it is a document store. A document store can express that. Some people also refer to that as an aggregate database, um, but the classic um, exam uh, ex um, description is a document store. So in our example, we now have uh, three kinds of documents. We have um, people, uh, space shuttles, and then we have some magical other document which describes which um, uh, person owns which spaceship. So in an SQL database, this would be the join table. Uh, and in this case, it's probably a join document of some kinds. So I will not give a long rant about joins, as I usually do at this point, because I only have 50 minutes. <laughs> if you want to hear a join uh, rant, then come to me later. Um, uh, joins uh, are nice, but they can get really ugly really fast. So there's a different way to approach the things that we can do with joins. Uh, and this is uh, uh, drawing a graph. And this is quite close to what I showed to you uh, before, what the domain expert might draw on a piece of paper. Uh, you have the Alice and we have the space shuttle, and then we draw an arrow in between them, and this is some ownership between them. And if you can do that, then your database is probably a graph database. Uh, in a graph database, um, we can now express this exactly in this way and then query it in an appropriate way as well. So now imagine that we have the space shuttle and it still has parts and we want to express this ownership relationship between those two. Um, then might, maybe we want to have both. We want to have the uh, um, possibility to embed stuff, and we also want to make ownership relations between them. Because Alice and the Space Shuttle are both entities, and these parts are uh, value objects. We want Alice to be its own uh, entity and connected to something else, but we don't want the parts to be something individual. We want to embed it because it's a value object. So there's a trick to do that. Um, what if we say that Alice is now a document? Then we can do all those kinds of things. We can query it, we can do all the nice things we can do with documents, and we can embed stuff in them. And then we do a second trick, and we say that the connections between those things are also documents. So we say, okay, this is also a document. Um, and we can also put a lot of attributes on them, like um, say, uh, owned sins, uh, for example. Um, and if we uh, can do those th two things in one database, uh, we are talking about a multi-model database because we are combining the model of a graph database with the model of a document database. So in the beginning, I talked about this disconnect uh, between those two worlds. We have the tables on the one side and we have uh, this domain drawing on the other side. Um, let's look at this again uh, with our uh, domain uh, uh, with our um, multimodal database, uh, we now can be very, very close to this drawing because now we can like say, okay, we have this ownership and it has also attributes. And this is easy to explain to someone who is not a programmer. Um, we can say, okay, we can draw this on a piece of paper and talk about it. So uh, my suggestion uh, for a process, if we want to try that out is, they're quite simple. So first, you sit down and you explain how graphs work. Uh, you say like, okay, maybe let's draw something here and let, let's draw this um, arrow between those two things. It's really easy to explain. I explained to a lot of people it was um, uh, not a huge time effort. Um, and I tried to do the th same thing with tables and joints and stuff like that. It was not that easy. Um, so I think it's easier to explain. And then it's time for you to learn. 
So you try to learn from the domain expert. You, the, the domain expert will explain to you how this entire thing works. Um, so we have space shuttles and we refer to the parts at, with th those terminologies and stuff like that. And then you take those two things together and from those you build a common language. You build something that you can communicate in. Because now you have vocabulary and you also have some drawing skills that you can draw together uh, on a piece of paper. And with this common language, you can now communicate about the problem, about the thing you want to build, uh, and therefore you build one model for everyone involved. Everyone involved understands this model and this drawing and the document you wrote together. Uh, and then uh, the m important part comes here, because um, otherwise you would say, like, this is big design upfront, I don't want to do that. Um, this is why I said you need iterative development, because now you evolve the model and the implementation alongside each other. So uh, every time you change the implementation, you have to think about, does this change my model? And every time you change the model, you have to think about, does it uh, change my implementation? Um, so this is the basic idea. Um, and uh, yeah, up there are my contact information. If you want to try out a multi-model database to try this stuff, uh, ArangoDB is one choice for that, which is open source, uh, so you can try that. Um, so thank you for listening. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm allowed to take questions. Yeah? Oh, thank you. You have 10 minutes more, so... What? You have 10 minutes. You gave me 15 More. minutes. No, because uh, it starts 10 minutes later, so you have... <laughs> On the schedule, it's 10 to 10, uh, 9 to 9.15, so I have 15 oh, minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I can also talk for 10 more minutes, but... Um. <laughs> yeah, there's a question, I think, yeah. So you have 10 minutes, so I have a question about join joints. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so in, in SQL databases, basically the knowledge about the relationships is, is on the developer side. Apart from foreign keys, you have to know how to you know, write your SQL query to get the data. How is it in these databases? Is it that you have this graph relationship and database knows that when you, for example, query a document, it can somehow merge the document automatically, or do you have the joints as well? Okay, so um, if uh, in, a, in the case of a graph database, um, it, it has the knowledge to say, you can ask an odd document, give me your neighbors. Uh, this is also the case for a, um, uh, for a multimodal database. So you can just say, okay, I have this document, give me all the neighbors of this. So you don't need to do explicit joins. You just say, give me neighbors. And it also, because it knows that things that have edges between them are neighbors, you can, uh, it has a natural way of saying, like, give me uh, common neighbors between two nodes, for example. Um, so um, it is uh, closer to um, what you really want to do instead of the technicality of what a join means. In the background, it may do a join, but you don't, like, you don't express that you do a join. So, so basically the, the optimization of joins is on the DB side? Yes. So the uh, people that built the database, they are doing this part for you. No more questions? Okay. Thank you so much.